guest is one of the legendary figures of British show business. She was born above a fish and chip shop in Rochdale, went on to become the nation's sweetheart on stage, on record, in films and radio. Indeed, Parliament once adjourned because she was about to broadcast. She was once described as the greatest entertainer this country has ever produced. And if that assessment causes a few raised eyebrows, all I can say is that the doubters never saw and heard Grace Stansfield of Rochdale, who became to millions simply our Gracie in movies like this. Gracie Fields. <laughs> You're not the type, are you? Though? Hmm? You don't know. No, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what. You're a remarkable lady. You really are. You're 79 now, aren't you? Some pushing 80. Pushing 80. Yeah. You're amazing. Just, just about three months off, isn't yeah. it? It's ridiculous. No. Well, it's it's not... too long. You shouldn't live that long. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it'll get it. Just watching that. There, I was talking to Sir John actually about that uh, clip we saw there. It was the most extraordinary voice you had, wasn't it? It was really remarkable. Instantly. I know. Excuse me taking this off. I put it on for swank. So <laughs> just... <laughs> You're stopping, are you? And it's, uh, yeah, I decided to stop. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I did have, I realise, I was playing a few of my old records. You know, I was making them so many years and years ago and working so hard in the theatre all the time, doing charity shows in the daytime, I never listened to a record. Only when I just passed it, when I'd made it. They say, is that all right? That's all right, I've done it. And I'd out the place. And I wouldn't listen to them. And recently, I was listening to some with my husband who was re-recording them and trying to bring up the sound of today. And I says, you know, I was a bit extraordinary. I've never heard a voice like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, I, I couldn't believe it but that I'd made those noises. It's just incredible. But well, it was an operatic voice, wasn't it? I mean, you it could was, have been an absolutely, opera yes. Mm, you never wanted to be an opera singer. Well, my mother wanted me to be an opera singer, but we couldn't afford it. No. Uh, it cost money to have lessons, and we needed the brass. Yes. So we uh, to do whatever we could do, uh, doing high kicks and acrobats and what have you. But was it really? I mean, it's, it was talking about 79 years ago now in Rochdale, which in those days was, was uh, what, a, 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 a mill town. A mill town. Um, I mean, was it really a sort of clogs and shawl existence? Oh, yes. I've got the marks today on my ankles where my clogs used to just catch my ankles. You have Yes, I have. Where? I'll show you there's lines around there. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to look at my legs. I wasn't going to show Sir John yeah, wanted to have a look too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wore clogs and shawls. It used to be awful in the winter time when it was snowing because my mother sent me to the factory. I was on the stage the first time when I was seven years old, yeah. uh, singing a singing competition. My mother always tried to find a house if we didn't have one big enough or we were rich enough to have one big enough to rent a couple of rooms to the theatricals that came to the old circus in Rochdale at that time. And uh, she'd find another house that would face a house where they did take in professionals. And uh, I used to sing up a little alleyway just by the side of our house. And so this lady heard me singing, one of them, a woman called Lily Turner, and she said, I want to put Grace into this singing competition. Yeah. 
And uh, so she taught me to sing the song. I remember it, uh, half it of it now? today, but anyway. What was the song? I was very, it was called What Makes Me Love You As I Do. What Makes Me Love You As I Do. But uh, I couldn't say what. I would sing What Makes Me Love You As I Do. What makes me think you're so divine? What makes me long to? You said, you must say what? What? What makes me love you as I do? And this went on until she was going crazy. So she said, you must sing what? So I sang, what makes me love you as I do? What makes me think you're so divine? What makes me long to... And my quats won the competition. <laughs> and then you went to work with Louis Turner, the same woman, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I went to sing to her a, a song from the gallery. She used to wear sort of short velvet, short pants with a sort of a manly coat. It was a funny sort of dress, now you think of it back. And she used to sing this song with such feeling. And I was singing it again in a chorus from the gallery. While I was singing it, there was an old lady one time, got very annoyed. She wanted to the, listen to the lady down on the stage and this child who was singing this chorus was annoying her. So she started to bash me with her umbrella. <laughs> well, I started, <laughs> I know that. So she wondered what was happening. So after then she put me on the stage to sing it. Yes. And then slowly I started doing a little single act around Rochdale, Castleton, Norden, and any tell of the, the party that was going on, what, I, I was going. What kind of what kind of venues were you playing, um, Gracie and those? Were they clubs or were they music No, no, no. The, there were sort of little charity shows that people were putting on <clears> all around Rochdale. Yes. I called myself the Tupney Pie Queen because they used to pay me in Tupney Pies. Meat pies they used to sell for tuppence. They're about ten and tuppence now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I ate so many tupney pies and took them home in my umbrella where I could pinch a few and took them home to the family. So we all had tupney pies to death when there was another concert on somewhere. What about school at this time? <coughs> was My mother didn't think school was necessary. She's probably right. We're she, a very wise woman. <coughs> she kept me home and she said, oh, you'll find out when you, when you grow up. It'll, it'll all happen to you. But she had to go to school because they paid two pennies a week which must have been very expensive when she was a child. Mm. But she didn't think it was necessary as far as I was concerned. I used to stay home while Mother used to go out and take laundry in and, or go and do a day's work at somebody's fine house. After I'd finished school sometimes, I'd go from my school, find out where she's gone, and I'd eat all the leftover rice puddings and things in the, in the fine house and that kind of thing. Yeah. But of course, you did go to school, didn't you? And you Little, yes, you quite didn't much like a it, bit. Did you? I loved school when I did go. Mm -hmm. And when I joined a juvenile troupe where I used to, uh, well, there was six, the first juvenile troupe, there was uh, the nine dainty dots. And uh, they didn't bother with me going to school. Or if I did go to school, each school in another town couldn't be bothered to teach this one child by herself. So they'd sit me on the side on that seat and give me a book, which I couldn't read, but I'd have to sit there until it was time to break loose and then get running back to my digs to go and join the kids at night. Then. I mean, it, well, the more you tell me about that, the more extraordinary it is that you became what you became. I mean, the, 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 as I said, you know, the biggest star in, in this country, I mean, the superstar, on the first of the, you, well, you were. Well, you never think of yourself as anything else but what you are. I never think of myself as a star. I know, I suppose, I know I have. I've been around, but I never think of myself. I'm just the same as I've always been. But, but I wondered how it happened, how that girl from Rochdale eventually went to London, took London by storm, and then took the condemnation. Because I was interested in other people on the stage, don't forget, I saw the different stars we worked with, and my mother used to write to me. She knew, she knew all about them because she was stage mad. And she used to take in the performer and the stage, the papers, the theater papers, and she'd write to me, you're next week, you're on the stage with Gertie Gitana, so don't forget to learn all her songs. <laughs> and uh, I had to learn them because I didn't go home and if I, knew, if I didn't know them. So I had to get very friendly with the stage manager if he would be kind enough and let me stand on the side of the stage, because they only allowed the children to stand on the stage 
a few, uh, one, at, uh, one at a time, and uh, no more. So then I got friendly with the men who pulled up the curtains up on the top of the lofts, and I used to go up there, please can I come up here, I've got to learn Gertie Gitana's songs. So I'm up in the top, watching them pull the thing up and listen to singing, my sweet Iola, Iola less to me. I, I, I forgot the word you can expect it to take to, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Nellie Dean, was Gert you were a fan of Goethe guitar. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember her singing Nellie Dean. Nellie Dean, by the old stream, by the stream, Nellie Dean. Yes, she used to sing all those. You know, I had a very sad experience for me because I thought that she was the biggest star in the world when I was a child. I used to listen to her even from the man who gets into the orchestra pit underneath the stage, I used to ask him, please, can I keep your door open so I can learn their songs? And uh, when uh, I uh, went to a, a charity concert in Chelsea, it must have been about 25 years or 30 years ago, and I hear someone singing one of my songs. And it was Gertie Gitana mimicking me. I cried, I said, oh, that's not right. She's such a big star because to me she was still that big star and she shouldn't be mimicking me. I'm only just Gracie Phillips from Rochdale. But I couldn't oh, feel, amazing. you know, it just oh, upset yeah. me, really. Yeah, you started off taking her off and she ended That's up taking right. you and off. That's right, and she ended up yeah. sort of taking yeah. me off. It's very there. funny. Yeah. What did you feel like when you came down this raw girl from Rochdale into, into London? I mean, it must have been a, a, a bit of a problem. Did you feel socially uneasy? The, the uh, no, I don't it. think I ever bothered about anything <clears throat> at all because I, when I, I'd been when I was a child in the juvenile troops and I'd, every time if I could go to a matinee and see a big star, mother used to write and tell me to go and see Shirley Kellogg and different uh, actresses and, and singers in, in London when I could get a chance. And I was always looking for somebody important. So she was really rumming all this stuff down my neck and to give her an idea, yes. so I was actually all mimicking everybody. Yes. But I mean, you also, at this time, too, in about 1928 or so, I mean, you cracked the London stage as well, didn't you? Now, there must have been, I mean, you met Sir Gerald de Maurier, for instance, who employed you. Well, there I must have been a certain amount of conflict there between this sort of high-bred, rather posh fellow and you. Well, we were different people. Eh? We were ordinary people in heart, the same, you know what I mean? It didn't uh, bother, so bother me. I said, oh, well, you... And when I went to the St. James Theatre, first thing I did was take my gramophone. I remember when I first bought my first gramophone, I was in Nottingham, and I got to know the girl in a gramophone shop. So I said, would you give me some very good records? I want classical ones. So she gave me a, a bunch of Caruso, galley kerchiefs, and different people. Well, I took those records home, and I was in a dream, listening to this wonderful voices. And I used to mimic them. I used to sing <laughs> all these things that uh, Caruso used to sing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I get the voice out. <laughs> it reminds me, just before I came here, uh, on Sunday, when we started off from Naples, we have a taxi man. So he's very puzzled at Boris sitting next to him. And a friend of mine who, who plays for piano for me, Teddy Holmes, you must know him. Yes. He was sitting next to me, and the driver was talking to Boris. Well, how are you going to do? These people are speaking English behind here, and you're speaking the dialect of Naples. And just so he evidently said something, oh, well, she sings or something. So I started. Vedio mari quando bello spiritanto sentimenti come tu che ti movente. And this man started going mad. Wow, oh, wonderful! He forgot to drive and he started to conduct me on <laughs> to the stage. Tell you, Boris, we've kept it all right. <laughs> but I finished it out right to the end when I got the station. Grace, of course, lives abroad now all the time. Could you do that? Could you live abroad? Anywhere I else? Oh, I only like living in England. But I why is that? Can't understand the language anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's all right. I just get through, you know. 
It's but Lancashire Italian. <laughs> but I get all I want. I want to know what's going on in the kitchen. I always say I'm either starring or charring. I can't keep still. So I do a bit of cooking one day. I do a bit of fiddling around cleaning. I'm playing in the garden. I find so many things to do. But you, you, just, you just feel totally an alien, would you? In yes, I very much like Italian people. They're very kind and very good with children and very cheerful, but oh, the noise they make. Yes. <laughs> you prefer a little more quiet? I so. like things yeah. quiet, yes. What about, you've, you've lived all your life, of course, down here, haven't you, in the South? I yes. say down here like it was sort of the southern state of America or something, but there is this, there is, as we all know, this North and South divide in Britain, still. In fact, you've not discovered the North until recently, have you? Quite lately, yes. And you like it, don't you? Very much indeed, and the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man, you like? Very I've fond never of that. been there. Oh, it's nice. You don't say. One place I've never been to, the Isle of Man. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes. And you, what do you like specifically about the North? People speak directly and Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like? Do you like Coronation yes, Street? Yes, it's my favourite programme. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it this week and I haven't seen it for such a long time and it takes me right back to Rochdale because oh, it's a lovely feeling of everybody knows everybody. We all interfere with everybody's business. We all want to know everything. <laughs> but I find that Capri people are the same in Capri. Yeah. All the Caprese, they all know everything. They want to know the tittle-tattle about everybody. But they're one family and I feel that the Lancashire people are like that. Yorkshire people up north are very much together much closer than they are down south. What do you, what do you like? What's your favourite character in Coronation Street? I'm hard put to it to say. I'm very fond of, of Mrs. Walker. And oh, I think, she's, I think Doris Speed, the actress who plays that, is fantastic. Yes. I think really incredible. And Stan Ogden Stan. and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> you like the curlers, do you? Yes. And I like Ken Barlow as a cultivated contrast. And I'm very fond of that very... Um, uh, pushing one that's going to do very well in business, Mike Baldwin, oh, yes. has lately appeared. What about Albert Tatlock? He's wonderful. He is wonderful, isn't he? He must have been on the halls. <laughs> I don't know if he was, actually. You know he lives in the Midland Hotel in Manchester. I heard that. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> 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 and you know that Ina Sharple speaks posh, don't you? Does she? Mm. Well, not posh, but I mean, it's... it's but she's uh, refined. Yeah. Yes, she's... Really? A... <laughs> <laughs> can all be refined, you know, just uh, the same. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were talking earlier, Gracie, about, uh, about filming. I mean, you had a spectacular film career. You were the, in the 30s here, the biggest film star in, in Britain. You also went to Hollywood too, didn't you? Yeah. You didn't like it. Well, I, I didn't like making films at all in the you beginning. Didn't. I couldn't stand it because you're waiting around and oh, doing oh. nothing. And when you do say something, you've said good morning, George, all day, and then it drives you crazy. And then when they locked the gate, when you've got you in, I always felt I was imprisoned and I can't get out of this place. Yes. But I could get out of a theatre. I never thought, thought of that. I mean, I got through the stage door. Yes. That's always open, I always felt, not morning, noon and night. Yes. But the film studio, I'd see them close that gate. They've got me. I'm stuck now for the day. Yes. But you must have met, when you're in Hollywood, you must have met some extraordinary people, people who you admired on the screen and the scene. Oh, yes, quite a lot. I, I, I did one or two good films, but... Uh, you did, I but remember. But not them. much. Do you? Uh, yes, well, I was a film critic in those days. Oh, you were? Did you review Gracie? I think probably, yes. Yeah. I remember that one we saw, what was the song in it? Well, and I remember Sing, as, oh, we Sing as We Go. Sing As We Go. That, that was done in, in, in England. Yes. But most of those stories were kind of written around me for some reason. They weren't real stories to start off with. The first film I ever made was Sally. Now, oh, that was written properly as a play and it was a very good play well you had something to play with the others were all stitched up around five or six songs get six songs ready grace because you're going to make a film and then it would have stitched up now when i went to hollywood and i did the one by arnold bennett buried alive it was mm. uh, the book it was called uh, uh, what was it called um, uh, holy matrimony. Holy matrimony. That's yes. right. Yeah. It was a joy to do that. That was d without a song in it, because mm. you had real words to say that the author enjoyed writing, mm. and then yeah. you enjoyed saying them. It was something to do. But when when a 
they, they're stitched around you, and, you know, they, they don't come up quite the same. Yeah. The stories were not good. Of course, in fact, J.B. Priestley wrote a couple of films for you, didn't he? Yeah, well, he did this Sing As We Go. That's right, yes. You met him, did you? Yes, well, you oh, yes. Did. He came to Kappa, yes. yes. He came with Basil Dean. They talked about the story and the, the, doing the, this thing. I said, well, I think it's going to be a kind of a popular thing. And uh, it, it might be make money and be all that. He says, well, we don't like to think about money. I said, well, what we're we working for. <laughs> <laughs> that was pleased to said that. Yeah. We don't like to think of money. Yeah. Yeah. You've never been afflicted by that, have you, Sir John? The thought that art should not make money? No. No. No, I think not. No, I, it's always amazed me that if it ever has. Yes, yes. But it's a nice, nice end product if it does. I think it's an extra kindly supplied by the management. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you finally, the two of you who've, who've lived many, many years in, in this country, what's disturbed you coming from what you did from an Edwardian background into the present time? Motor cars, I think, have made things much worse. That's another thing, yeah. I think people go mad when they get inside motor cars and become quite like fiends. I know <laughs> I do myself. <laughs> people forget to walk. Yes. I got rid of my car when I was 70. I said, I'm going to walk. How oh. marvellous. <laughs> Up those hills in Rochdale. Up those steep. hills in Capri, too. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you know Rochdale, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Lovely place. Rochdale. My, we had a, a great grandfather. He lived till he was 103. And uh, when he was 100, they gave him some special prize or something. They said, so he had free tram rides. So he killed himself, my father said, by having free tram rides. He never walked after he got that <laughs> prize. <laughs> Died of goodwill should be the That's epitaph, right. I think, for that gentleman. Now, we're going to, you're not going to get away without singing for us. And you're going to sing, I hope. Do you, do you remember Grace's comic songs? Yes. Uh, John? Mm. What about the Aspidistra one? The biggest oh, Aspidistra. Oh. <laughs> you, must be, you must be sick of singing that one. I'm you? sick of seeing it, sick of hearing it. Are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if you want it. What was the story about it, Grace, the sort of background to it, you know? Well, it, this uh, man who brought all these songs to me for many years, he brought it one along. And, but when I went to America, I remember we were doing a very big, uh, there was a three-hour marathon radio show for charity. So I was on this show doing three songs, which I did. And uh, Bob Hope was the uh, Hope. MC. Mm. He said, we're 10 minutes short. Have you got another song? I said, yes, but they wouldn't understand it. He says, what is it? I said, the Aspidestra. He says, what's that? He'd forgotten because he'd been in America too long. I said, he says, well, never mind, sing it. Well, when I sang it, I really it caused a sensation because the Aspidestra has a different meaning to the Americans than it has for us. <laughs> It's got a different meaning for me than I suspect it does for you, but... Um... Well, it always meant a, a plant, the aspidestra of plant. Course, yeah. And all up north, I think everybody has an, an aspidestra aspid plant. Yeah, right. I know my grandmother used to have one, and my mother had one, and my grandmother used to put paper flowers in between them. That's right. <laughs> well, our, our MD, Mr. Harry Stoneham, is waiting over there. Oh, Gracie, well. So if we wander across there, Gracie Fields. Put your shoes on, Lucy. <laughs> the music we hope for the best I hope I remember it <laughs> right <clears throat> for years we had an aspidestra in a flower pot on the whatnot near the hat stand in the hall well it didn't seem to grow till one day our brother Joe had a notion that he'd make it strong and tall so he crossed it with an acorn from an oak tree and he planted it against the garden wall. Well, it shot up like a rocket till it's nearly reached the sky. It's the biggest aspidestra in the world. We couldn't see the top of it, it got so blooming high. It's the biggest aspidestra in the world. When Pa 
fathers had a snoot full at his pump, the bunch of grapes. He doesn't go all fighting mad and getting into scrapes. You'll find him in his bare skin, playing Tarzan of the Apes. Up the biggest aspidestra in the world. The pussycats and their sweethearts love to spend their evenings out. Up the biggest aspidestra in the world. They all begin me when the buds begin to sprout from the biggest aspidestra in the world. The dogs all come around for miles, a lovely sight to see. They sniff around for hours and hours and wag their tails with glee. So I've had to put a notice up to say it's not a tree. <laughs> it's the biggest aspidestra in the world. I could have You like the lyric? Yes. Who wrote it? You, this uh, Bill Haynes. Clever man. And somebody else. There were always three or four names because they used to join in. I don't know how much they put in in each one, but yeah. there were always three or four names on it. But Bill Haynes had this little music shop, and he was a consul too for Haiti. He was a really a funny. Cockney, real Cockney, used to say, Grace, I've got a lovely number for you now. This is the best you've ever had. Now I'll sing it for you. He says, wait a minute, I'll get right. And he said, now, Walter and me, we've been courting for years, but he's never asked me to wed. When leap year comes round, I'll give three hearty cheers, all right? Because I do the asking instead. And he used to go on with that. And then another time he came, he said, they got this Sally, which I was talking about. Yeah. And I, I wondered where you got okay. it, but we found out yeah, it's a little, uh, it, wor yeah, it worked so. out fine. That was by Haynes, was it? Yes, it was part of the Sally song. He, he might well become our favourite lyricist yeah. after Cole Porter and Lawrence Hart. <laughs> yes, yeah. Bill Haynes. I Bill thought Haynes. he was going to say, write, one, uh, uh, write one for Peggy, you see. He, uh, he, might, he should have done, shouldn't he? Mm. I mean, mm. he should, should have written that one. He yeah, should have written a love song for <clears throat> Peggy, yes. Isn't it bliss? Are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground, you in midair. <laughs> That's Stephen Sondheim. Where are the clowns? <laughs> Sending the clowns. Yes, a little, yeah. little night music. The show. A little light music. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Sondheim. Yeah. yeah, lovely. The one thing that's discernible um, from people like you, great stars, the one thing that separates you from the rest actually is your energy, your boundless, boundless energy. Well, it's I can't amazing. Keep me still. I got, I got that from my mother, I guess. <laughs> it's God given. Anyway, Gracie feels you're yeah. still a great star. And thank you very much for being well, my guest thank tonight. Thank you very much and for asking me. Thank Bless you. you. Nice to meet you. John, it's always uh, a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you very much indeed. I think he's lovely. I wish I'd been his Elsie. I'm six years older than Dallas, but I don't mean that older than him. He's only 71. <laughs> I was only 71. Well, thank you, Warren. Oh, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a Warren. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, until Thank the you, same Christopher time. Thank you, Christopher Robin. That's right, until the same time next week. Good night. <laughs> Dan 
Snow is up next on BBC4, discovering London's railroad links to Britain's other cities with his history of the railways.